A very warm welcome to our first webinar on the fifth round of the European Home Parliaments. And we are very, very happy to have two great speakers and guests and politicians with us today. Uh, but before I welcome them and uh, I give you, um, before we start the discussion, um, I want to give you a brief overview what you can expect from today's session. So our dialogue with Gwendoline Del Boco Field and Francisca Brandner will focus on the future of European democracy, what needs to be changed, what are concrete reform proposals that we should have an eye on or even fight for. And the structure of today is uh, we have a little short introduction, then a warm hello to our guests, and then we will directly dive into the discussion and exchange part and we'll cover all the three main questions that were also at the core of the last home parliament round. And then we will have like a final question and a brief um, outlook. And yes, I would warmly um, like to welcome Gwendoline Delbos Corfield. Um, she is a member of the Euro European Parliament. She is following and supporting the home parliaments now for quite a while. We are very, very grateful for that. And the good thing is uh, that she's part of the Committee of Constitutional Affairs at the uh, European uh, Parliament. And just to let you know, later today or later at this session, Francisca Brandner uh, will join. And maybe you already also know that she became State Secretary at the Federal Ministry of Economic Affairs and Climate. And in days of the war in Ukraine, um, these are very busy days. So she will join us a little bit later. And I'm Martin Speer. I'm an author and uh, supporting Pulse of Europe in the, um, with the project of the European Home Parliaments. And I will uh, be the host of today's session. But before we uh, get started and look a little bit back to the fifth round um, of the European Home Parliaments, I would like to ask you, Quendoline, uh, you know, not only um, for in terms of security, um, these are very challenging um, times for Europe, maybe also for our democracy. And maybe in, in the beginning, I, I would like to know from you throughout the last weeks, did you learn something new about European democracy? Did the recent developments changed your view on our democracy? Mm. Um, I, I, I don't specifically think that something, I learned something. I, um, I was impressed by um, the reaction of the governments and the member states. Um, so let's say that um, my, my natural um, cynical pessimism on, on national interest and national egoism um, uh, selfishness, uh, selfishness um, was was um, was surprised by uh, by the fact that um, governments and and members member states really acted in in a solid way and and were immediately supporting Ukraine, uh, except for a few examples, but really very specific ones. Um, I think that, of course, the personality of the Prime Minister of Ukraine made a lot on this, um, and, and um, uh, Ukraine people can be very grateful to him because I think that he embraced the situation in such a way that he really put pressure and, in, and, and spoke to his colleagues all over the world to, to give them more political courage and to, to oblige them, in fact, to, to support mm -hmm. him. But, but still, uh, they could have been more weakness. So I think that was uh, a good surprise, if, if we could say. Then for the rest, no, I think, I mean, I've been working since the very first day I arrived in this parliament um, in 2019 on, on the issues of, of rights and liberties. And, and I've been working on Hungary specifically, but also Poland, Bulgaria, um, Serbia, 
so I mean, uh, I, I, I know how bad things can become. I've been working also on disinformation, so I'm not surprised with the attitude of Russia. Um, so I, I sadly, no, on this I didn't. I, it just proves what we've been saying a lot, that uh, on one hand, um, you, you have to take seriously the question of democracy, of fake news, of, of media pluralism and all of this. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, um, it also proves that when you are all together in a process, well, you can be stronger and, and, and we're still not strong enough for Ukraine. That's for sure. I, I, I don't think we at the level of what would be needed, but we, we could have been so much bad. Uh, we could have left them. Um, I mean, because uh, a lot of things we had seen in the Chechen situation and we didn't mm -hmm. act at all. So I think on this, we showed that, you know, when you really stand for something, it, it can be a bit powerful and it can mm -hmm. be useful. And thank you so much. And to, to follow up on that a bit, so you, you, you were talking about the importance of a European democracy and states coming together. You are actually working in the powerhouse of European democracy, the parliament, this very fascinating place. Did it somehow, over the last weeks, did the atmosphere somehow change in the parliament? Did parliamentarians realize, oh, wow, this place working together is even more important? So was there like a change in the atmosphere? No, I wouldn't say that. I think that um, here is a, a place where those that are involved with the others go on being involved with the others and some really work in a very national way or come back to their own issues all the time. And that didn't change. What I think changed is the view on, um, <clears throat> for example, on the topic where I'm working on, on Hungary. I think that the threat of what is happening in Hungary uh, is huge. And, and so now we really have a lot more of members of parliament that are worried and concerned about this information, about what is happening in Hungary. Um, I also think that um, uh, everyone felt that there's a, a, an even more important part in Europe. I think that those that can be sometimes a bit more sceptic, I mean, the Eurosceptic has, and will not change, they stay Eurosceptic, but in the other groups, the progressive groups, or, or even in the conservative groups, those that maybe I'm less involved, I think they realized. Um, and also, I think that everyone realized maybe also more our power. Um, sometimes, uh, I, this is going to be one of your topics, I mean, uh, to this evening, sometimes, um, it's really frustrating because the council doesn't take enough account of what we do, the commission neither. We have the feeling that we do a lot of work here and we're not very powerful, in fact. Um, and But in the little margins of power that we have, we also not always fulfill it. There's a bit of a feeling that, you know, uh, we have to obey in the end at the council or the commission and we will not dare do certain things. I mean, we always threaten of not voting the budget. We always vote the budget and that sort of thing. Um, mm -hmm. I think in these last weeks, we have seen that when we put pressure on, on, on the energy, uh, energy crisis, when we put pressure on the question of helping Ukraine, when we put pressure on the question of, of democracy and liberties, we, we, we can do things, so it maybe also empowered us a lot. It, it also has to, has to do, I really want to signal this with mm -hmm. the new president of this parliament. Um, I mean, I don't agree with her, uh, half of her agenda because she's a conservative, but she is bringing this parliament to a level where it needed to be. And, and I think that no other men before her had done it. I think that that also helps. She is standing um, as an equal to the two others, to Ursula von der Leyen and Charles Michel, as a real third institution mm -hmm. that is as strong mm -hmm. and as interesting. I think this also helps. But all of these factors mean that maybe, yes, the, 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 the use of what we do here um, is, is more clear maybe for everyone. Mm. Yeah, thank you so much for giving this insight. And looking back in European parliamentarian history, it was often women that uh, were there in very important moments and shaped the way. So uh, good choice. I don't know if you voted for her at the uh, very important day, but maybe you did. 
Um, so before we get started with the first question, I want to uh, give a quick introduction uh, into the format of home parliaments that we are all on the same page. That's always important. And then uh, we uh, look into the first question and we are very curious what you think about it. And we, we are also curious what the citizens that participated um, are thinking about it. So I will share my screen again. Please, please give me thumbs up if you can see it. Uh, yes, okay, perfect. So uh, quickly, who's behind uh, the home parliaments that pulse of that is pulse of Europe, uh, a movement that probably everybody uh, knows it's uh, not affiliated to a certain party it's bringing people together and and sending out signals into the uh, society that a united Europe matters and the home parliaments and I was thinking oh it's way more powerful to express the concept with pictures instead of words uh, and you can actually see what the home parliaments are all about it's people coming together three to eight people discussing debating over three important questions on European society, future, and in this term, it was all about the future of European democracy. And we provide them with some support materials to help them having this debate. It's one and a half to two hours, and then people vote on those three questions as parliamentarians would do it in the big parliament. So that's the concept and you can see people are having fun, having, are having a good time. So thinking and debating about Europe um, is also, and can be an expression of joy. And I think that's important also to remember in very serious times. So the last round, this new round in 2022 uh, was focused on the future of European democracy. And there were three concrete reform <laughs> proposals that were discussed. And uh, we talked a little bit, she already mentioned it, uh, Gwendoline. Should the anonymity, un, anonymity principle in the Council of the European Union be abolished and replaced by qualified majority? So not everyone has to agree anymore. Should a representative citizens council advise the EU institutions on fundamental decisions? So citizens being a support, maybe not only once, but often and constantly. And lastly, should the European Parliament be able to propose and initiate its own legislative proposals in addition to the EU Commission? For out, people standing outside, it's always surprising that the Parliament can't do it, but hopefully this might change. So th this was question number three. And just some quick data. Uh, it, the, the session happened from end of January to beginning of April. There were around 600 people from 17 European countries that participated. They came together in 77 sessions. Most of them took place offline. I think that tells something. People want to come together again, not only online. And yes, a majority took part from Germany, from Austria, but also like a good part from the Benelux, from Portugal, and from France, uh, Cyprus, Poland, Bulgaria, Hungary. I think we can be stronger on the international side in the future, but um, overall it's very nice that around 600 people came together. So before we get started, um, this is all about the dialogue and not only me and uh, Gwendolyn talking. Um, so if you have a question, you can use the Q&A uh, button that you should find on your screen and put your question into the chat. Or if you write before it video question, you can then be, we can then see this and bring you uh, on the digital stage. So use the chat to bring in your ideas and questions. So let's get started. Um, I want to present how the citizens and how many of you hopefully voted on the first question where we are talking about the future of the council, this very powerful body in the EU that isn't really playing on eye level with the parliament. And uh, a majority of you, an average on an average score of 7.5 on a score from 
one to nine said that they want to see change so that they don't want to have all member states agree to something that they want to maybe see a qualified majority being able to make decisions um i think it was interesting that on the on the on the side of support there it was a little bit split so it's not like super powerful support but uh, a clear majority um Quendolin, what do you think about it? Um, um, are you also in favor of uh, uh, replacing the existing system and yeah, giving, giving more flexibility to the uh, voting procedures? Uh, yes, this is an easy one because I'm, I, I am uh, completely <clears throat> convinced that we need to abolish unanimity. Um, <clears throat> maybe, maybe on very specific topics, you know, like doing a wall to someone else. I mean, uh, hopefully we, we, we should have a number of things that would prevent that. But if it had to come, I mean, this, this would be unanimity or an, a few very specific topics, very, very contentious one could stay under the unanimity system. Um, but it would be a clear 10 for me because I think that it's no lot more uh, necessary for most of the topics. Uh, it Once again, I mean, Europe doesn't uh, deal with everything. There's subsidiarity, some things are still in the national level and it's good on the regional level and it's good. What is on European level today is <clears throat> is a common work and a common future and a common progress. And, and, and we need now to act quicker and, and, and in an easier way. Um, and I also think that in some very specific cases, it's, it's awfully dangerous. Um, the, the, the rule of law topics is, is a very clear example where the unanimity is even really putting us all in danger and putting Europe in danger. Um, that's, that's the reason why an autocracy has been able to develop in this mm -hmm. member state. <clears throat> now, nearly, you know, 99% of the think tanks and organization in the world say that Hungary is, is really no more democracy and clearly going to a, an autocracy. And, and this has been possible because unanimity has prevented the council to act in a number of cases. <clears throat> um, even if on some topics, the member state itself is not even counted. Um, so I really think that we need to move on this. Um, uh, it's, it doesn't mean that we need to have more uh, topics that are, are pu public policies that are dealt with at the level of the European Union. I think that we have now a package that is quite good, maybe a bit more social aspects, a few new topics, but mostly we have that. Mm -hmm. But now we need to have a force that is more um, um, powerful and more and more quick and, and big and that will be uh, taken out with unanimity. Um, so thank you a lot. You were I think in the beginning saying that um, in the area of foreign affairs you're maybe skeptical to uh, to have a, a majority voting system um, but wouldn't and that's also that was also reflected or pointed out by the participants that maybe exactly in that area uh, we need to act faster and we need to decide faster and send out a clear signal uh, you know this also has a downside obviously but um what's what's your stand on this foreign affairs eh, i don't know should it be or not no, I think we are we are not yet in in the in. I mean, already a, a lot of member states of uh, European Union uh, declare themselves as Pacific mem member states uh, or neutral, and they've already made a move that is quite. Um, uh, it's not an easy one. Um, there's also the NATO question, of course, and all this. So I think that on on this, uh, it would be really rushing things. Um, to, to think that tomorrow we can have a quick, uh, responsive answer in such a moment of threat of, uh, as, as uh, entering a war, for example. Um, and, and I think the Ukraine situation has also shown that reason and, and discussing anyway has managed to nearly get the, us there in, in not that long. Um, 
but I do think that indeed there needs to be more coherence in the in the in our in our foreign affairs topics and in relation with uh, with with uh, with the rest of the world. I think that indeed we need a common <clears throat> uh, common uh, point of view, a common uh, a common um, sometimes uh, a common force, and all of this. That I do think is true. I was giving the the the, the example, but and on most foreign affairs topics, I think that we would not need unanimity. I was just thinking of mm -hmm. of the big, big, big topics, and and this is the one that came up to me uh, the, the first. But I guess that in in other topics, I mean, I I mean, I, I guess that in every topic, be it economy, be it environment, be it social, be it um, foreign affairs. There could be one exception, one big topic that we know is contentious. Sorry, <coughs> I've been speaking a lot today. Um, Thank you for uh, speaking with us. Be out of, that could be still under the system of, of unanimity. I think this is a, uh, something that we should um, consider because today, I mean, we are even talking about hypothetical for the moment because most of the member states don't even want to leave out unanimity. So I think that the first period of time and probably a long one of a few decades would be one where you still have unanimity for, for a few very contentious subjects. Um, and that for the rest, we could leave it and we could come to the qualified majority. That would be a dream situation because we're not even there in fact. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I wanna now also look at the downside of things and um, people that participated in the home parliaments highlighted that there is a certain fear of, or the risk of imbalance, that bigger states might dominate smaller ones and the voice of Malta and Cyprus isn't heard anymore. Uh, what's your take on that? And secondly, as you are in the committee of uh, constitutional affairs, basically, what is the majority of people thinking there, are they really frustrated that uh, there is no reform of the council or maybe you can give us an insight into the, in the into people thinking in this uh, committee? Yes, I, I, I really think that this fantasy about the little countries being um, dominated by the big ones is a fantasy. Um, uh, you know, it's so the, you've got the, the joke about the fact that we had various president of commission that were coming from Luxembourg, the fact that today we have a president of parliament coming from Malta, the fact that we have, uh, you know, uh, in a number of other institutions, people coming from little countries, um, and, and I think that um, um, if we work well together, um, this is not really an issue. We need to have a number of safeguards that will always help. The first safeguard is already that, of course, the number, for example, of members of parliament sent by these little countries is, is nothing in comparison of their population. I mean, Malta gets uh, six members of parliament. Um, compared to Germany, who gets 80, it's, it's got no representation between the, the number of people in the country. And, and so, so a, a German member of, of parliament represents much, much more inhabitants than a Malta, Maltese member of, of parliament, which is normal, which is our rules. And we have a number of things like that, that always ponder, I don't know if this is a good word in English, ponderates, but yes, makes the balance for mm -hmm, the little mm -hmm. countries, for the middle-sized countries. So that's the first thing. Mm -hmm. we, uh, <clears throat> um, we have voted today in parliament and it's a huge success because um, uh, we were not sure to have it. We managed to get the, a proposal on transnational list. It's the first time that this parliament uh, has a majority for this. Now we will have to go to council and, and then we will see what happens, but it's a very, very good step. The idea of these 28 members of parliament that would be elected on transnational list, um, there is all of this taken into account. So you would have to have uh, always someone, if you get, if you have presented someone from a big country, then the second one would have to be from a little country, and then the third one would have to be from a middle country. So we have this sort of safeguards and they are in a number of places and in the council the same. Uh, and you could also, I mean, the fact that uh, a Maltese chief of government has the same level of vote, 
then the German chef, chief of government is already a balance. Um, it's, mm -hmm. They don't have half a vote or a quarter of vote because they have less population. So I think that this is already taken into account. I also think that um, transnationalist, for example, is a good solution because these people will be European members of parliament. They will not be German members of parliament or French German. They will be European. Um, and we I finally have good. one person, one vote, right? That's like, like a very big step that happened today, like for those seats. Yes. Yeah. And, and um, um, I mean, I think that a lot of us are already working in a very European way. Um, I would say today a quarter of this parliament thinks European. Um, and, and we give as much energy to fight for the rights, the women's rights in Poland, uh, for, for, for the liberties of the rights of the Hungarian people, but also for the future of those in the southern country, the young people in southern country, and we do not work for France, or we do not work for Germany or Portugal or whatsoever. I would say that's a quarter of us. And another quarter, so half, uh, added would mean a half, another quarter, is a balance. So it's already, um, I think, a, a, a huge development. I, I remember uh, hearing about Parliament years ago where people were really only interested in their national level. I think that mm -hmm. also in Council and Commission, we have people that have a European vision. We also have in Commission, sadly, some commissioners that have a very national agenda, but most of them don't have, and the same in Council. So I think that this is come, starting to produce its effects. Um, and if we have more and more of ways of, of working in a federal way, like transnational list, but it can be in other places, in mm -hmm. a federal way and not thinking nation, all of the uh, 27 nations um, added, then this question of, you know, acting uh, only for the big ones won't exist anymore because it will be proven that we take time to, 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 um, to work for everyone and even for those in, and not even, but in the mm -hmm. same, at the same level for the inhabitants of the little countries. Mm -hmm. I mean, this European spirit would be ideal. So maybe. <laughs> but it, it really does already exist. Mm -hmm. And you know, you but... also have, I mean, the European parliament, for example, is also an example of the European city uh, society and the same in council. You also have a num more and more binationals, mm -hmm. members of parliament. Uh, you also have more and more people that are not living in the countries where they are elected or they right. are elected in a country where they were not born. Um, and, and this is more and more the case. And, and, mm -hmm. and the same in council and commission, you have more and more uh, people engaged that are not just the representative of their member state. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, build a perfect bridge, uh, I think, to question number two, because um, you were talking about the diversity of the parliament and, you know, we are also a continent of diverse citizens and these citizens were at the core of the second question. I didn't see any questions in the chat, so maybe if, dear audience, if you have any ideas or questions, you maybe want to raise it during question number two. And we're still waiting for Francisca. You know, these times are really challenging for the national governments. And she, oh, in that moment, she is joining. I mean, that's, that's, that's a good signal. So, da da, Francisca, we are super happy that you are with us. Maybe you will also appear in a second. Here she is. Hello, Francisca. It, it is so nice that you made it. Uh, we, you are, warmly welcomed at our uh, lovely European discussion. H how was your day? Maybe I can ask this first before we continue. I think it was tough, or? You know, it's just always a bit crazy these days uh, because you have a plan and then something comes in and everything changes again. Um, so yes. We just had a discussion on how we want to reform the European trade agenda. So very important. Wow. I mean, we're super grateful that you made time and uh, that you're also carrying that uh, responsibility for uh, Germany. So uh, thank you so much. We were just uh, uh, covering uh, question number one on the future of the council and now jump into question two. Uh, on a possible representative citizen council that could advise the EU. 
And I will share my screen to show you how the citizens voted on that. And then we can discuss this question also with Francisca and Gwendoline. So the uh, question that those 600 citizens discussed and voted on was, should a representative citizen council advise the EU institutions on fundamental decisions? And you should know that the, um, the ideas behind this topic for the fifth part, round of the home parliaments were also inspired by the uh, conference on the future of Europe. So it was all about democracy, citizens roles, etc. And we were really surprised how the people voted on this question because it's a 5.6. So basically it's half half people weren't really sure. Do we like the idea of the citizens council or not and people had a lot of questions. How should it be built that's really uh, really demanding for people being there. Might this be a competition for the European Parliament? So people had a lot of open questions. Others were very excited about it. Um, so I would be very curious, uh, Gwendoline and Francisca, uh, what's your stand on a possible representative citizens council that advises the EU institutions? You want me to start? Maybe you didn't talk so much yet. So. <laughs> yes. Salut Gwendo, by the way. Um, <laughs> um, you know, I, I think what I would prefer is to institutionalize the um, citizens' consultations on specific topics and to keep the principle that you have a representative um, representation in terms of, you know, age, countries, gender, uh, education background, financial background, um, and and to really then, you know, ask specific questions that they can give an answer to, and that will have an impact. Uh, I know that the Belgium system is a bit different; that you have a standing citizen council. Um, but uh, we have studied it quite in detail, and and I think it's. Um, more effective to <laughs> define topics that you ask an opinion about. And the question is how, you know, what, who can propose topics, et cetera, and there you can involve again citizens, but um, that usually the representative citizens council in terms of, uh, you know, tirer au sort that you are, it's, um, um, that it's better if, if there's a precise question and the follow up that people can mm. see what they have worked on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that was also mentioned by the citizens that it couldn't be really impactful. And if you don't have an impact, you're frustrated and you think, oh, uh, that's maybe just a show off, but there is no power behind it. Um, Gwendoline, what's what are yes, you? Yes, I would on? agree. Um, I am very, very uh, in favor of citizen implication um, in between elections. I think we, we lack. Um, that that engagement a lot um, and that we have been uh, believing too long only in representative democracy and not in participative democracy. I think the conference on the future of Europe showed that it's very meaningful. We had also a convention on, on climate in France that showed it. There are examples on a number of things. Um, but I wouldn't, I don't think it would be interesting to have a sort of a professional uh, uh, representative, uh, council representative of, of, of citizens, because um, then, you know, what's the difference with us that I elected? Because that's always what I say to people, you know, I, I'm still a citizen. Uh, I, I, I still do stupid things every day. Um, and, you know, I, 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 I buy my own food and I do my own stuff. I don't live in, in another planet, in another world. <laughs> So we, we also have the necessity to stay citizens and to stay in contact with citizens and with normal life. And that's, that's why we elected. On the other hand, I do think that on a number of very specific topics at one moment, um, or when we want to indeed involve, make a democratic moment, evolve, uh, uh, make a change in the situation of a democracy, then it's really useful. I think that's what we showed with these citizen panels during the Conference of the Future of Europe. People, they decide for four months that they will be very engaged and it's impressive. I mean, they gave weekends to this. Um, it also means that it's a meaningful um, in, in, in involvement because they need to understand the topic, to read, 
to you know do a lot of work if you do the if you take for example the convention on the climate in france these people for one year they 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 gave so much time because they had to go through all these uh, uh, very documented things they had to to uh, to listen to scientists on on the situation of climate biodiversity mm -hmm. agriculture and all this they had to to learn so much and then take wise decision and debate it so it was interesting but it was on one topic um so i think this is a very good option and and we 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 i, I we've just asked today in this parliament i made a, <clears throat> a, a speech about this but i wasn't the only one to say you know we must have a follow-up of these citizens' panels on the Euro mm -hmm. on the European level uh, for other moments. Is it for the the follow-up of the conference on the future of Europe? Because I hope this is not completely finished, um, that we will have other moments to work on this, but also for certain very relevant topics that we decide we want to discuss with the citizens. Uh, mm -hmm. We need that um, very often, but I don't I don't believe in a permanent council representation. Mm -hmm. uh, I think from the side of Pulse of Europe, uh, we really like that you uh, said um, that also the continuation or learning from the conference on the future of Europe and finding a way to have this more frequently or make it not a project, but a process. And um, I, I want to bring in one comment by uh, a home parliamentarian. He or she said, you know, there are already Europeans, there's already the European Citizens Initiative, and there are already enough opportunities out there for input. So maybe it's on the side of the citizens that are not seeing all those open doors and things you could do or talk to you two, uh, or you, both of you, because you're also citizens and members of parliament who could be approached. Aren't there already enough opportunities out there, but people are, I don't know, too lazy to use them? <clears throat> it's always the debate uh, are people lazy or are they not aware enough and and is it their fault if they're not aware i'm not sure um on the european citizen initiative it is a good tool and it should be used i mean it's a good tool it should be a good tool and it should be used the problem is today the commission disregards every time these european citizens initiatives they're already very difficult to 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 gather because it's a bit of a burden the number and all this but a number of, of they they a number of organizations have managed to raise the number of people for good european citizens initiative and then the commission disregards so we need we really need the commission to to be serious about this it's a huge problem and we're very upset about this mm -hmm. but it is a tool that should be used there are also indeed um uh, other ways to get involved, but then we also come back to the problem of governments and um, uh, national media uh, not saying enough about Europe, not giving enough information, not making enough awareness. So, yeah. I mean, is it the fault of citizens if they never hear about Europe, that then they don't get involved? G good point. And I think uh, uh, Francisca was also having something on her mind on that. Um. No, I just wanted to say, I don't think it's either or, it's very different instruments. Mm -hmm. um, the beauty of the Citizens Council as used now is that you get people who normally would maybe never sign a citizens initiative or go to a local event, but that you get randomly picked and then can decide to join. Um, and I think it's much more representative than many citizens initiatives. Um, and I still like the citizens initiative. I just think it has a different target group. It has a different goal. So for me, it's really not either or, but mm -hmm. it's to see how we can complement representative democracy with elements that do bring a different viewpoint to the table. And I think, you know, in that sense, we continuously developing the tools and new ones are developed and maybe we give up on old, old ones. Mm -hmm. Um, for example, in my home state, we have seen that some form of the previous, like 20 years ago, citizens engagement that you do a round table and you're asking everybody to come. Seriously, you get usually the same people and it doesn't help you to solve the problems. So, um, mm -hmm. and I think that's why we continuously do develop new models. Um, but, you know, that's the beauty of democracy. It's, uh, it's libendic. It is not dead. No, no, it's very, very vivid and changing. 
Yeah. And maybe thinking of those instruments like a toolbox. Also in a toolbox, you have different tools that you use for different types of work. Um, yeah, I think one question from the audience, I'm not sure if we can answer it at that point. Uh, there was the question, how many petitions to the European Parliament are there in a legislative period? Maybe, that, maybe that's a question that need to be Googled. Okay, <laughs> I think we need to uh, we need to do some research on that. Uh, maybe we can, Volker, maybe we can come back to you with the answer. I will note it down. Okay, I would like to uh, get to uh, our third question and the last question that was discussed at the fifth round of the European Home Parliaments, and there, and I think. There, it was not a big surprise that there was a big majority of citizens supporting it. It was all about the future of the European Parliament. And like in the European scene, uh, it's like a classic to discuss this, but it's definitely giving more power to the European Parliament, giving them the right to propose and initiate their own legislation. Finally, and uh, a clear majority, uh, 7.5 said uh, on average, uh, that's important to us. And there was a really big number uh, of people between that, that voted eight to 10. Uh, so that really uh, were uh, in support or in favor of this. Um, I mean, I, I already have a guess what you're uh, thinking, but uh, Franziska and uh, Gwendolyn, um, is it time for more power for the parliament? And if the answer is yes, how could we get it? Uh, well, we just... Um, <laughs> yeah, we just... Maybe, maybe, yeah, sorry, maybe the member of the uh, European parliament starts and then a former member of the European parliament. <laughs> All good, yeah. No, we are. We have. We are. We are voting at the moment on a, on a, on a resolution in the Constitutional Affairs Committee uh, on the right of initiative. It's it's a um, it's a cycle one that it comes every term. So every term the Parliament votes its resolution saying we need the right of initiative and yeah we put pressure and it doesn't work for the moment. But of course, so there we have a, a, a very huge agreement. I think. Even the Eurosceptic, I'm not sure even the Eurosceptic are not against. I think this is a, a unanimous uh, uh, feeling mm -hmm. in, in this parliament, even more for all of those that are um, um, used in their own member state to, to, to parliamentary democracy. It's, it's less frustrating for French because the French uh, National Assembly is awful. So, so for us, it's, it's, it's even better in European parliament, in fact, than in France. But for most of our colleagues, the Germans, for example, it is, it is quite a surprise that here we don't have right of initiative. Um, for, for all of those people working in, in parli parliamentary democracy, of course, it's, it's a, a, a great frustration. So we need to change it, of course. We, are, we request it, we ask it. Um, and hopefully one day we will evolve on this. That being said, we already have certain rights. There's co-decision on a number of things and all this that are also for the moment misused uh, by the council. I mean, when we try to use them, we are not listened to. Um, there's really a problem in the council to consider the parliament on a number of things. Um, on the rule of law topics, we, we are normally very relevant and we are not invited. Commission will be invited to a number of things like the hearings of article seven for Poland and Hungary, but some of the topics and we are never invited when we should be. So there's a real, um, uh, disregard for the normal equity between the free institution. This is really mm -hmm. a problem. Um, and, and there's also a problem on transparency. We never know what is happening in council. They have no transparency on what the decisions they take and why they take it, who voted what. Uh, the same for, for what happens in trilogues. Uh, often we vote something in this parliament, then it's completely changed during the trilogues. And, and we have been a bit um, squeezed, the parliament. So there's a number of things where already in the remit of what exists, there's a, there's a, a, a content for, mm -hmm. the, for the parliament that is not normal and, and not good. Mm -hmm. um, and there's also a lack 
from this parliament to, to obtain uh, what it should obtain when it's needed. It, I, at the very beginning, I, I started by this thing about Roberta Mezzola, maybe for the first time being someone that will try to get this. Uh, we really need in this um, parliament to empower ourselves better. We don't enough for the moment stand for our place. Um, and then the idea of solution is indeed a right of initiative in the next years. Uh, we will ask it again and one day maybe. And maybe it could become a little bit easier also thanks to the help of Francesca because you're not only a passionate European, now you're also part of the German uh, government. Wouldn't it be a great opportunity for the German government to also fight for the right for initiative for the European Parliament? Wouldn't that be a great Scholz moment and Brandner moment? <laughs> no, we have that in our coalition treaty in Germany. Um, so yes, uh, I hope that in the process now that it comes as a follow up to the conference on the future of Europe, we can um, strengthen the right of the European Parliament and as well as Gwendo said, strengthen the transparency of the European Council. And uh, to, to get, get concrete on that, either of you can answer that. How to get more transparency in the council? Is it about like open sessions? How citizens no. can listen? No, no. What's, no. what's the... The most important transparency is to force governments to have a discussion on every single EU commission proposal within the given time frame. Um, because often you don't know, uh, or like if governments don't like it, they just never put it on the agenda. Um, mm -hmm. And there have been quite a number of laws that have just been sunk, like killed in the in the cellar. Um, and that's what we want to avoid, so that we do give a time frame for member states to position themselves on every <coughs> position by the Commission. Mm -hmm. And before open session, I mean, that's that's really for in, in 50 years. Um, <clears throat> but before that, we could already have a report after every session of the Council, uh, a bit more transparency on certain votes. Uh, there again, I mean, uh, hoping tomorrow to have full transparency on who voted what is crazy. Um, it, it would be good, but it's it's it would be asking really too much from the governments so that they're not ready for it. But we could start by having a process of transparency on some votes. Um, and, and once again, we, we should have more reports on what happens in the council. We should have the council also um, coming here in parliament to answer questions. I mean, very often we don't even have the council sitting here uh, when, when it's topics that are precisely theirs. Um, we always have the commission, it has to be said. I mean, the commission is there very often, they answer. Um, and sometimes they even answer in a very honest way uh, and, and, you know, really trying. I mean, it's not just uh, a blah, blah, politically correct blah, blah. The council uh, is, is, is very often not here to answer um, and, and is not, uh, yes, giving, giving um, um, uh, how do you say, uh, is not uh, explaining the consequences of a number of decisions that they take. So we, we would need more of that interaction. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's only maybe 500 to 600 meters from the council building to the parliament. So also that argument, it's too far, doesn't count. Okay, maybe in the future, I hope you keep uh, pushing. Um, I wanna really respect all of your timeline today. So uh, before I sort of get to the end of the discussion, I wanna jump back to question one and also give uh, Francisca the opportunity to uh, share her perspective on that. And uh, I want to bring in a question of uh, Peter Funk um, on uh, the uh, principle of unanimity. Un I don't like that word. Un un unanimity. Also, the Einstimmigkeit. So, um, un un it's unanimity. Unanimity. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyhow. Um, so, we probably need an agreement of all member states to actually change the law to get rid of it. Um, how realistic is that? And what gives you hope that somehow this might happen? Or is there an alternative route, a short link 
uh, to get this through. To change a law that's tough to change. Maybe Francesca. You know, um, what gives me hope is that is in the worst case, we just go ahead with a few and we do create a defense and foreign policy union with a 15 and we create our own set of rules. Um, just like the way it was done on Schengen, on the Euro, that if you don't get everybody on board, you go ahead with a couple. Um, <coughs> to try to do it all together. And if we cannot, then, you know, I think it would be time and Macron is a good partner for that uh, mm -hmm. to go ahead and um, create a, a defense union, a foreign policy and defense union and do it together uh, mm -hmm. and start with fewer. And those who want to join are welcome. I'm no longer ready to uh, to be paralyzed by Viktor Orban. But is this then uh, actually that's very nice because it might be a topic for the next session of the Home Parliament. But um, <laughs> is this then step by step going towards a two speed union? I was actually wondering why aren't why we aren't why we are not having this discussion again because we now have new applications, we have like differences among existing states. So why not having like two speeds, like a basic membership and an advanced membership? We already have this. True. In so many respects, we have those who do participate in Schengen, not all. We have those who participate in the Euros, others that don't. Um, we have so many layers already today within the European Union. So I don't want to hear any more the two-speed Europe. We have like already a six-speed Europe. <laughs> um, so you no, know, let's be frank and honest and look at what we have and what we're doing and um, not pretend that there's the one EU that we have currently. But we have different layers already. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we are in a country that is participating in all of them, but this doesn't mean that because it's the case for Germany, that's the case for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, so, but so not I everyone is as outspoken as you to say this in that way, because some people still think it's really important that we stick all together at the same sort of, of speech. It would be lovely, but if it's not possible, then it's not possible. Yeah. Uh, and in mean, fact, it yeah. would be different. Sorry. In fact, it would be different if it was really a two-speed, meaning sort of you have a core group for everything, and a, and a, uh, you know the bad people on this on the, another circle around it. It's not like that. It's some of them participate in something and not in another thing. So I think we never <clears throat> should lose the the target and the goal that everyone should be in everything. Um, and 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 that's what we do. We we often come back to a certain number of member states saying, you know, why not participating in this? Uh, we we at the moment for the for, for example for the general prosecutor, we really want the member states to participate in the general prosecutor's thing, uh, so that we can fight better corruption. And we're putting pressure on those that are not doing it and all this. So so we should always have this target. But the truth is already it's it's indeed. Not everyone is doing the same thing exactly, but it's not the bad ones and the good ones. It's much more uh, complicated and, and stream mm -hmm. that, than that. It's people, it's some member states in this and some member states in that. So um, indeed we should advance on some topics with, with uh, uh, faster with those that can mm -hmm. and want. No, very nice. Um, looking at the time, uh, I think we have one more minute. And uh, uh, I want to close by presenting you how the citizens of this home parliament session were voting on the um, overall question. You know, there's like an overall question um, above those three concrete reform proposals. And not surprising, but there was a 94% approval on this major question, does Europe's democracy need a fundamental update? There was only one rejection. Um, so I think this uh, gives a lot of support uh, for your work uh, that is progressive and uh, embracing change, Francisca. You know, I could, of course, always say there's nothing that you cannot improve, and especially not the democracy um, or European integration, because it's never perfect. But let's not forget, you know, that maybe it's also really the time to defend what we have. Mm -hmm. um, 
and that I'm no longer ready to talk about European you know, lack of democracy or European being not democratic. Um, you know, seriously, yes, we can improve it. We must improve it. Uh, but can we focus please on the substance that we have to get to, that we have to protect the climate, that we have to insecure our, um, you know, defense capacity, that we have to protect Europe, that we have to defend the democratic institutions like an independence justice, that we have to defend the press freedom, that we have to increase, uh, you know, fight for better education, whatever. And I, and I sometimes I believe that it's time to make sure that our speaking of a democratic deficit, our speaking of the lack of European democracy is not feeding the wrong people. Um, and that we always make sure that we do in a framework that makes clear that we do know what we have and what is at stake and that we know that democracy is not perfect the european integration isn't perfect but these days you know i'm so glad that we have the eu that it has you know delivered on so many goals um and and i just think sometimes we have to be careful of also how our discourse and our framing um can be perceived and is sometimes misused. That's a lot of, these are deep thoughts to process. Um, <laughs> I think there's nothing to add. That was a really important point. Thank you. Uh, thank you, you two for um, taking time for getting into the dialogue with us. There weren't like super many questions of the people that were with us in the room, but uh, I hope everyone uh, enjoyed this exchange. It was really nice to see you two together, um, also debating and seeing each other again. So thank you very much again. And uh, maybe three quick pieces of information. So there is a next round of the European Home Parliaments, probably starting end of May, beginning of June. And one topic that Franziska was mentioning will be part of it. Uh, it will also be about defense. There will be a next webinar dialogue with Nicole Bea from the Liberals and someone else we don't know yet who will join on 1st of June at 7 p.m. And there will be one with Katharina Bale and Manfred Weber that needs to be scheduled. So there are nice things to look forward to. Um, thank you everyone for joining, making time, um, spending this European time with us and I wish you a really nice evening and I hope we all see each other soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.